Welcome back to The Real News Network. We're talking to Gareth Porter about the great jigsaw puzzle that is the Iranian-Russian-American relationship about Afghanistan, Pakistan. Thanks for joining us, Gareth. So we talked in the first segment about this Russian-American relationship and the Russians talking about pulling back on sending this advanced defense missile system to Iran. There's all kinds of leverages and cards being played, the Russian roots uh, uh, controlling supply lines into Afghanistan that the Americans badly need now. So th th there's clearly grounds for all kinds of regional collaboration here, but none of that has anything to do very much with what goes on in Pakistan, where so much of the issues reside. In the tribal areas, at a time when there's enormous antagonism towards the U.S. role in Afghanistan throughout the whole of Pakistani public opinion, and at the meltdown of an economy. So look at this big jigsaw puzzle now and put Pakistan into it. Well, it seems to me that this latest development in SWAT, uh, which is outside the Fatah region, the, the federal uh, administered tribal area of, of Pakistan, and that's one of the reasons that there's been such alarm expressed at what appears to be a concession being made to Taliban militants in that uh, This is a deal the where the Pakistani government agrees to allow the uh, lo local tribes to have Sharia law as the law of the area. That's right, yes. And, and again, the, the, these are not the tribal groups in the Fatah region. Uh, this is outside that. It's in, in the rest of Pakistan. And in an area that's supposed to be controlled by the Pakistani that's, government. That's right? correct, exactly. And, and it's, it's the area which is uh, north of, uh, of Islamabad on the border with Kashmir. Um, and, and it does appear to sort of parallel in a broad sense the past efforts to sort of have a reconciliation uh, accommodation between the Pakistan military and local officials and militants uh, in a particular area. And in the past, of course, that hasn't really produced peace. It hasn't produced a, a genuine stand down on the side of the Taliban and other militants. And so the fear is that that's exactly what's going to uh, be happening in this case, that even though you know, they've agreed to uh, apply Sharia law and supposedly the militants will stop fighting and there won't be any more uh, sort of aggressive actions uh, in that area, uh, that that really won't end the, the fighting, it won't end the, uh, the activity on the part of the militants try to, to try to move forward. Um, one of the issues, however, that's different here is precisely this issue of Sharia law. It, it has, in fact, been a real point of discontent uh, in, the, in that region of Swat, the Swat Valley. It, it is a genuine grievance, in other words, and, and so one could suggest here that we need to wait and see whether this could be, uh, you know, partly at least helpful in Because the critique in the past by American officials and others have been it just gives the quote-unquote insurgents a chance to reorganize and get ready to fight again. Th that's right. That's the downside. But, but the question is whether there might be an important upside in that this was a, a grievance, that, th that there is a real problem with the court system that has existed. Uh, you know, the traditional sort of uh, Pakistani court system, which is corrupt, it's inefficient, it's ineffective, and, and discredited, basically. And so, so there may be a real rationale here for trying this out. Uh, and I, I think the larger point here for those who are looking at it from the United States in particular is to say, we really don't know enough to understand how best to manage this problem in, in Pakistan. It's very, very difficult. It's not something now, that is, is outsiders it, can address. Now, President Zadari has been a, a, attacking the Americans for these predator attacks uh, that are firing missiles into compounds and villages, often killing uh, civilians, sometimes apparently killing uh, senior Taliban fighters, maybe al-Qaeda fighters. And there's been another critique of Zadari that, in fact, it just came out a few days ago that these attacks actually might be being launched from bases in Pakistan and that the Pakistani government actually knows all about it, and this right. is all a rhetorical position being taken place. Well, I, I think that probably both of those are true. I mean, I think that there's not necessarily an inconsistency between the fact that uh, the Pakistani government is generally very unhappy with the, uh, with the attacks that are being carried out by the United States because they do think that they are, uh, on balance, something that is hurting the Pakistani government's uh, ability to get public support for its efforts against the Taliban. Uh, and they do generate enormous anger within the areas where they take place. At the same time, 
Uh, Pakistan is highly uh, dependent on the United States for its economic support, particularly, and it's very easily uh, uh, understandable that uh, they would have agreed uh, reluctantly to have the United States go ahead with this under duress. Now, the, the, let's, let's say there, there is an, a, a way to have a, some kind of a deal with Russia that gets a certain amount of Russian cooperation in Afghanistan, perhaps even a deal with Iran that gets a certain amount of Iranian cooperation. Maybe they get their supply routes, um, but they still seem to be only talking about a military operation, both on the Afghan side and on the Pakistan side, and, and most people seem to think that a military operation isn't, can't be the answer. Well, well look, I, you know, there, there's no doubt, even in the minds of the planners at CENTCOM, General Petraeus and his staff, as well as the military in, in Afghanistan, and, uh, and, and the sort of Washington-based Pentagon thinkers, that there is no military solution in Pakistan. It's simply, there isn't even one in Afghanistan, and even more so, that applies in, in Pakistan. The CENTCOM plan, uh, by now it's sort of leaked out that, that it is very, very strong on saying that there's going to have to be a non-military approach to addressing the problem inside Pakistan, that there is no military uh, approach there that's gonna work. And, and that sheds, I think, even uh, more glaring light on this problem that we've just been discussing of the predator, uh, the drone uh, missile attacks that have been carried out in Pakistan. This is an approach that just doesn't make sense from a strategic point of view. What they're doing here is applying a kind of, you know, sort of uh, bee sting approach uh, aimed at, you know, killing off a few leaders when the, really, when the problem is a strategic one, that you've got a movement there that is continuing to gain mass and momentum. And it gains mass and momentum for political reasons. And these predator attacks are adding to those political reasons why the, the uh, militants, the Taliban militants, are gaining ground uh, as time goes by. In the next few weeks, we'll know just what, what their strategy seems to be. And we'll return to it then. Uh, thanks for coming. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network. Donate today and receive a new documentary film available to members of the Real News Network. The History of the National Security State with legendary author Gore Vidal. Bonus features of the DVD include an in-depth response to Vidal from ex-CIA analyst Ray McGovern, who served under seven U.S. presidents, an exclusive interview with Colin Powell's former chief of staff Larry Wilkerson, and an insightful interview with oil policy analyst Antonia Yuhas. News magazine of the screen. Living glimpses of history in the making. Hollywood and Washington, there's a symbiotic relationship. They both deal with illusions. Reality doesn't often uh, play much of a part. I think I saw through the myth of the uh, Cold War almost from the beginning. I was a Washington political kid from a political family. Roosevelt first had radio because he had a, this great speaking voice and everyone liked to hear. Truman proceeded to break every arrangement that Roosevelt had set up for a peaceful coexistence. And Truman thought that it would be a good idea. Why not just stay armed all the time? And then he devised the national security state. You've got to go up and swear allegiance to the United States or else you're a commie. I mean, we, were, we had imported fascism. We get Dwight Eisenhower, who said that we have this great military industrial complex. It is a dangerous thing. And he said, this is going to change everything. And the way our country's governed, it's going to change us politically. Along comes Jack Kennedy, who wanted to make his mark, believed in the Cold War. But he said, in this kind of politics, it is the appearance of things that matters. I think everybody should take a sober look at the world about us. The national security state still exists, only it isn't communism anymore, it's terrorism. This is the most serious thing that has happened in the history of the United States. Knowledge is power. We need an honest new system. We need the real news.
This is the sort of thing we can build right now without anyone else's permission from the government or from the business community. It's the powers in our hands. If we're not going to sleepwalk into more wars, we think we need to start with a television news network that won't bow to pressure and has the courage to seek facts. And that means independent economics. And that's why we need you. Make a tax-deductible donation now of at least $10 a month or a one-time give of at least $75. As a thank you for your support, we will send you the new documentary film, The History of the National Security State.